So let me now introduce you to our speaker of today, which is Brecht Egelo. Brecht is an organic chemist by training and he obtained his bachelor degree at the University of Hasselt. After that, he also obtained a master and a PhD degree at the KU Leuven. He has currently a position at Janssen Pharmaceutica, where he works as a senior scientist in process safety, and he is also a volunteer in the company's fire department. Explosives are one of Brecht's great passions in life, and he enjoys sharing that knowledge. He has been giving training in explosives to firefighters, civil protection, and law enforcement for almost a decade now. He is also a lecturer for the Adviseur Gevaarlijke Stoffen postgraduate study at the University of Antwerp. And then I will give the word to Brecht Egele. So please, the screen is yours. Very well. Good evening, everyone. I hope my slides are coming through <laughs> just fine. Um, as has been said, my name is Brecht Egele. I'm very happy to welcome you into this new year. We didn't have fireworks, well, at least I didn't, but I hope I can instead give you a little bit of insight in chemical explosives, which is one of my great passions in life. I'm a chemist um, and chemistry has been my number one interest all my life since I was a little boy, but love starts somewhere. And for me, love started with explosives, my love for chemistry. So as we are walking through this uh, beautiful realm of these powerful molecules, Keep in mind that um, just not, I'm not only trying to share you a passion for explosives, but also for chemistry itself. Chemistry is truly a power of transformation. You can turn matter into other matter or matter into energy. And there is no better way to show this than to show you how explosives work for dramatic effect, of course. So today I will teach you about uh, some of the explosives. I'm, I'm a chemist, not a, a historian. So you'll see, I'll focus a lot on the, on the chemistry. We're going to use history more as a kind of guide to show us the different portraits of the molecules of explosives as we will see uh, on our journey. So what are we going to talk about today? I'm going to show you um, the different types of explosives. We're going to start at the very beginning. Uh, what is an explosion? Then we're going to go to the grand, grand, grandfather of all explosives. That is of course, black powder. Uh, or gunpowder. We will then see what Nobel, Alfred Nobel, better known for his Nobel Prizes, what he had to do with explosives, a great deal as you will see. We will then go into some darker parts of human history being World War I and World War II, and to then go on into a more recent realm, the current technological innovations that are have taking place in the explosive science. And at the very end, because of course, unfortunately, every presentation about explosive isn't complete without some uh, very recent, let's say, points of attention like, like terrorism, of course. Um, so we will end on a maybe sadder note, let's say. Explosions, first of all, what is an explosion? This is an explosion, um, which you can see here, is an explosion of about one and a half tons of, uh, of gunpowder, of black powder. So I hope that made you a bit of me made you a bit more awake. <laughs> so what is an explosion? Uh, an explosion is in essence, a very rapid release of energy so fast that it cannot be dissipated to the environment in, a, in, a, in an easy, slow way. It has to go so fast, it generates a pressure wave, usually also a lot of heat. And that pressure wave is going to cause usually damage to the environment. Uh, here we see the explosion has shattered the house in which it was taking place. Fragments are strewn around. There's a shock wave uh, taking place. Very dramatic, of course. This, this to me is, is an explosion. Um, there are many ways in which you can cause an explosion. Um, you can cause an explosion using obviously chemical means, which is what we're going to talk about today. You can also cause an explosion with purely physical means. Uh, for example, a pressure explosion. Uh, from uh, from overfilling a vessel, for example. You can, of course, obviously also create an explosion using uh, nuclear fission or fusion. Uh, I won't talk about that today. That is, that is more the realm of the physicists. And there are also some more exotic things, like, for example, solar flare explosions. That is for sure not my expertise. We won't be talking about that. No, we will be talking about the chemical explosives, uh, obviously. And as I said before, 
Let's start with the oldest of all explosives, the venerable grandfather of all explosives. And I can't put it in better words than, well, Satan himself in Paradise Lost. The deep shall yield us pregnant with eternal flame, such implements of mischief as shall dis dis dash to pieces and overwhelm whatever stands adverse. You see, Satan um, needed to fight the armies of heaven. And to do that, he needed very powerful weapons and he made gunpowder, of course. Um, he still lost, uh, by the way. But this already kind of shows you how gunpowder was perceived at the very uh, beginning. More of a devil's tool, particularly in the West. However, gunpowder did not find its origin in the West. It was, inv it was invented in China, actually, already in the 19th, in the 19th century. Um, back then, maybe perhaps very ironically, uh, the people who first developed, uh, let's say, the initial form of gunpowder were Taoist alchemists. And they weren't looking for a weapon. They were actually looking for an elixir for immortality or eternal life. So you can understand it's very <laughs> ironic that instead of eternal life, they found an efficient way to end uh, lives. Uh, Taoism, for those who, who may not be familiar with it, is, is, an, is an old Chinese religion. Uh, I think it's mostly known here for its association with the yin yang symbol. So I hope that whenever you see the yin yang symbol now, you'll be thinking about gunpowder and we're thinking about me. Um, so these guys were very interested in the essence of things. And that actually was a boon to them because they wanted to purify everything. Whenever they wanted to make a new alchemical concoction, they needed to purify the ingredients first. And by doing so and mixing things uh, in various proportions, they came to the fire drug, a mixture that produced flame, vigorous flame, and also caused a slew of accidents, of course. Obviously, they took a great interest in this. And it's maybe a, some kind of a misconception. Sometimes you hear that the West uh, is the one that weaponized uh, gunpowder. This is absolutely untrue. Uh, the Chinese were uh, far ahead of us. They already used it in warfare in the 11th century. So that's almost more than a thousand years ago. Um, the first gunpowder weapons were relatively crude. Uh, on the left-hand side, it's, it's here. You can see a fire lance, actually a very rudimentary device, simply a spear with what's basically a piece of firework attached to it, filled with gunpowder. You would light the fuse and stab down at your opponents, usually uh, when they were attacking your walls, whilst shooting forth uh, flames of gunpowder at their face. Very intimidating. In the middle, we see another beautiful weapon, aptly named um, the Nine Arrow Heart Piercing Magic Poison Thunderous Fire Eruptor, a sort of arrow launching proto gun, uh, in a sense. Um, we're going, we're going further with these, uh, let's say, proto-missiles, which were actually just overblown pieces of firework in a sense. But uh, keep in mind, and we will see this also later when we're looking at the, the more Western implementation of gunpowder, for the medieval mind, uh, gunpowder was something incredibly intimidating because not just the fire, but especially the sound. You have to keep in mind, an exploding piece of gunpowder at that time must have made a sound that you can only ever have heard during a thunderstorm. It was magical, it was intimidating. Um, that's why it was also a very powerful weapon of war. Um, during a famous battle in China, a uh, naval battle in, in Lake Poyang in the 14th century, they made incendiary devices uh, based on gunpowder that were aptly called no alternative. I really love the Chinese and their, uh, and their gnomes for weapons. Um, in the West, actually, uh, gunpowder only arrived around the 13th century. Um, and as I've said before, it was mostly the domain of the devil. Uh, you see here on the right-hand side, a depiction um, of Bertolt Schwartz. Bertolt Schwartz is sometimes called the inventor of gunpowder in the West, but there actually, there's not really a consensus whether that man was really a real figure or more like a mythological person like Robin Hood or something and more a kind of persona or personification of general in general people in 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 the west that were busy weaponizing and working with gunpowder here you can see him loading a cannon and you can see clearly satan the devil whispering the secrets of gunpowder in his ear because to the medieval mind in the very beginning gunpowder was a tool of the devil it was uh, it smelled of sulfur it caused tremendous noise that no man and wielded power that no man should have. 
And of course, these gunpowder weapons were, in a sense, incredibly dishonorable. Uh, any uh, simple peasant with a gunpowder weapon could kill a knight or a nobleman. Um, another important figure in Western culture uh, regarding gunpowder is Roger Bacon, uh, probably familiar to most. He's actually, he was for sure real, and he's probably the first one who really studied um, gunpowder to some extent in a proper way. He wrote it in his book as well, um, where he found the gunpowder to be so powerful and dangerous that he wrote down the formula for gunpowder in a kind of cryptical way. Um, here, translated rudimentary um, as six parts of saltpeter, five of young willow uh, ash, which is charcoal, and five of sulfur. Now, this uh, formula is definitely suboptimal, as you will see. But he was very afraid of it, nonetheless. Uh, he wrote literally in his book, this secret is a key which opens and no man shuts. As you have seen, once gunpowder opens something, it's probably never going to shut again. Um, another important work in Western culture regarding gunpowder is the Liber Ignium, uh, Ad Comorandus Hostes, very uh, nice old manual, which contains all sorts of incendiary uh, weapons. Literal translation of this book is then also the Book of Fire, uh, to set fire on your opponents. Very nice. Um, in fact, the true weaponization of gunpowder in, in Europe itself only started around the 14th century with rudimentary gunpowder weapons such as the Riboko, which you see here, a sort of yeah, multi-barreled gun uh, used to, to shoot from short range. We, of course, had the cannons and the bombards, uh, the, the first cannons. It's important to note that the, the technological uh, formation of innovation of cannons went hand in hand with metallurgy because the problem was, I mean, gunpowder was known for a long time, but the true cannon took a while because it's very hard to control the energy of gunpowder sufficiently to launch a projectile without also blowing up the gun in which it is in. That really required a higher level of understanding of metallurgical principles, which took until the 14th century to really, to really develop. But once there, it progressed relatively rapidly. Uh, and cannons and gunpowder also dramatically changed the way warfare was done in medieval ages, especially siege warfare. Uh, cannons were very powerful and could smash down uh, walls. A good example is the siege of Constantinople, uh, where perhaps one of the first artillery barrages in history was done uh, by the Sultan Mehmed. So um, we also see down here some rudimentary firearms. The first firearms, actually it resembled more like a hand cannon. It was operated by two people, one holding it and the other lighting the fuse uh, to shoot um, the, uh, the cannon, basically. You see here a, a British musket from the 18th century. So the 18th century or before we truly had uh, the, the typical muskets that we know. And to quote the poet uh, Tom Carlyle, gunpowder made all men tall in the sense that you didn't need to be, uh, uh, you could be a knight a nobleman trained in the art of war for all your life, a simple peasant with a gun could kill you uh, in the blink of an eye. So, dramatic change of warfare, thanks to our beautiful gunpowder. It wasn't only used in war, although that was certainly the first application. From the 17th century on, it was also used for civil projects, um, like, for example, blasting, blasting of bridges, um, making rivers or canals. In fact, one of the greatest engineering feats of the 17th century, um, the Canal du Midi uh, in south of France to connect the um, Atlantic with the Mediterranean Sea was actually made, well, partially or mostly thanks to gunpowder um, as a demolition material. It's now UNESCO heritage is still there. You can, you can go and visit it. But how do we make black powder? Because I know that's what you really want to know, of course. Um, we can have a look at the Liber Ignium and, and see how to best burn our enemies. Um, there they give a very old formula, one pound of sulfur, two pounds of grapevine charcoal, and six pounds of saltpeter. This is not really the optimum formula. The optimum formula is more along these lines, 75 weight percent of saltpeter, 15 weight percent of carbon, charcoal, and 10% of sulfur. You may wonder, okay, but what do these ingredients really do? Uh, so each of them has an important role to play in the final mixture, because black powder is not a, a single compound. It's a mixture of, of different uh, components that each have their part to play. Probably the most important one is the saltpeter uh, or potassium nitrate is the more chemical name. 
this is the oxidant. This is actually the compound that, in a sense, delivers the oxygen for this very rapid combustion that is the ignition of gunpowder. Now, saltpeter was actually known for a very, very long time. Uh, you can find it um, in, in natural deposits, especially in areas where there's soil that is very rich in nitrogen, because nitrate is one of the ways in which it's found and made in nature is by bacterial action on um, nitrogen compounds, uh, like, for example, ammonia or urea. Um, and when they produce the nitrate, nitrate is quite soluble in water. So in parts of the world where there's a lot of rainfall, like, for example, in Europe, the nitrate will be washed away. It will be difficult to find the nitrate anywhere in a place where you can find, where you can have rain. Um, in other parts of the world, like India and China, there are, in some parts of the country, large, I mean, long periods of drought, so with no rainfall. And in this arid climate, the saltpeter can rise to the surface and actually crystallize out and can be found, for example, in caves and so on. Um, in Chile, there is even a deposit called Chile saltpeter, which is sodium nitrate, which you can convert into potassium nitrate easily, uh, which actually one of the main sources of nitrates uh, up until uh, the First World War. Um, so one can obtain it in nature as deposits. One can also find it, for example, in basements and other areas where there is no rainfall, but still plenty of nitrogen-rich soil. Uh, very good type of soil, for example, is the graveyard. Uh, corpses uh, are a great source of nitrogen. So again, very beautiful poetry in there somehow to make a, a weapon from the dead. Um, however, here in Europe, uh, natural deposits are a bit more rare. Luckily, the medieval mind um, was uh, very in innovative and they made niter beds. Niter beds are a sort of artificial way of, of producing the ideal circumstances for bacteria to grow and to enact their magic upon um, the, the nitrogen organic material and make the nitrate. They're basically compost heaps um, that you would protect from the rain and leave for a year or two they do the bacteria to do their work. It's very important that manure is present, so um, excrement from animals or people, and very important urine. Urine is a critical component. Urine is rich in urea, as the name implies, which of course has a lot of nitrogen in there. So people making nitrate beds were advised to sprinkle daily with uh, urine. And apparently the best urine came from regular drinkers. So somebody who really liked wine, was a great uh, contributor to these to these nitre beds. Um, at some point, the king of uh, of England even obliged the, his subjects, whoever was able, whoever had land, to have nitre beds and to uh, to give their potassium nitrate to to the king for making gunpowder. So, um, if you ever if you have a big garden, lots of manure and a full bladder, you may produce your own uh, <laughs> strain of uh, potassium nitrate. The oxidant. The fuel then, uh, if you have oxygen for com combustion, you also need a fuel. The fuel comes mostly from carbon. Uh, charcoal, as you know, is, is pure carbon, um, like the same one we use to, to light our barbecue. Uh, uh, very simple. The old way of making it is basically combustion of wood under very oxygen poor uh, conditions. So you really, you, know, you create these, these you, know, you can see above there, like these, this black charcoal, uh, very typical. So this is what's easy and cheap to make. The last ingredient is sulfur. Sulfur is a binder or a catalyst. Uh, you can make sort of black powder or gunpowder using only potassium nitrate and carbon, but to really get it sensitive enough to get this fast burning action, you need a sort of binder or catalyst, and that is where sulfur comes in. Sulfur fulfills this important role of lowering the barrier for black powder to ignite and giving it also a better consistency. Now, sulfur can also be found in nature, either as pure deposits, sulfur deposits, as you can see there, or as minerals such as pyrite, which you can then reduce uh, to pure sulfur. So you can see black powder is nice because it can be literally found in nature, its basic ingredients. It, of course, needs to be purified if you want to have a good powder. But that's why it was quite cheap. Now. Now that we know how to make it, you may wonder, but why does it work? Why does black powder work? If you look at the very beginning, um, what I was telling you about explosions, we need a fast release of energy, very fast. The energy will come from the chemical reaction. So obviously the chemical reaction needs to be extremely fast as well. Um, now, 
there are many ways in which you can have a fast and a slow reaction. For example, if we would light a match, we would burn up the wood slowly. There's a lot of energy being released there in the form of heat, in the form of light, but the release is slow. So a candle or a, a match in this case would not be considered explosive. However, if you would take um, the same, uh, the same uh, fuel, let's say, like wood, you would powder it, make it very fine. So there's a lot of surface and mix with oxygen, for example, by blowing it up into the air, or creating a cloud. You have a very intimate mixing of the reagents. In this case, fuel, basically wood or wood dust and oxygen uh, from the air. But you're creating an intimate mixture and a lot of surface area. When you then ignite this, you will release all that energy in a short time frame, resulting in what would be called an explosion. This is the principle of dust explosions, for example. That is why wood dust, uh, why a, a piece of wood won't explode, but if you would ground that piece of wood up to a fine dust, disperse it in the air, so mix it very well with oxygen and ignite it, you would be you would get an explosion, as you can see uh, to the right. So it's important to get this intimate mixing. And that is exactly what is also needed to make the gunpowder. If you would just take potassium nitrate, sulfur, charcoal, all just throw it together and try to ignite it, it nothing much would happen. You need to have an intimate mixing. There are a couple of ways to do that. This is the beautiful artisanal method. Uh, you basically grind all the components together uh, in, a, in a sort of bucket or mortar and pestle. Obviously doing this with dry material is probably not going to be your best day. So what one did was you would add some water to it, make it moist. The water acts as an inhibitor in a sense. As long as it's wet, it's difficult to ignite. So you would grind it while still wet. This would give you chunks of gunpowder, which would then be sieved. See this man over here doing it? He has a sieve because it's important for a good burning rate that the particles are not too small, neither too big. Too big particles will burn too slowly, huh? which is not good. Too small particles, however, they burn too fast, which is also not good depending on the application. If you want to build a gun, for example, and your gunpowder burns too fast, the pressure will rise so fast in your gun that it's, there's a good chance it will simply explode in your face. So you need to have an optimal grain size. And that's what the sieve was made for. So they would basically rub the wet or still moist um, black powder or gunpowder through the sieve, making grains of a particular size. Now, this is the artisanal way how it was done for a long time. Um, obviously, at some point, industry takes over. And we have these industrial mills where basically the components were walled together using these huge stone and later metal uh, discs basically weighing several tons. They would waltz over the components and mixing them intimately uh, while still wet, of course, into a kind of hard chunks that would later be broken up and sieved. Obviously, this was rather dangerous. And every now and then, a gunpowder factory also went up in a big bang. Here you can see a uh, artist's impression of an explosion of a gunpowder storage uh, in uh, the 17th century in Delft. So gunpowder manufacture has always been fraught with, with danger uh, and the risk of explosions. That's why they were also at some point also usually far away from any inhabited uh, cities or, or dwellings. Very good. We have our intimate mixing for a fast reaction, but we also need to still produce this energy. And I've already kind of lifted the veil on this one. Um, if you remember from basic fire training, our fire triangle for a combustion uh, that typical exothermic uh, reaction that also generates gas. We need an oxidant, ignition, and the fuel. Uh, these components, of course, uh, I've also already told you that in, in the gunpowder, the oxidant is, of course, potassium nitrate. The fuel is the carbon and the sulfur. And so also something interesting also happens here. Because the oxygen, in a sense, is coming from the nitrate, we don't need air. In other words, gunpowder will also burn perfectly fine in a vacuum, for example without any air present or in an inert environment. So you cannot extinguish uh, gunpowder by taking away the air because the oxygen is already in the mixture itself. Now, the ignition part, um, and this is, I guess, basic thermodynamics. Um, you have all these components. They have a high energy content, especially the nitrate. They want to turn into other compounds like carbon dioxide, carbonate sulfates that have much less energy. To do that, however, they won't do it spontaneously. They need a kind of a kick. They need a little bit of an, of an, of an ignition. Right? You need to have a 
they need to conquer this little energy barrier. You need to jolt it with a bit of energy enough to get it started, and then it will go all the way to all these low energy uh, products, releasing heat um, in the process. This activation energy is, is the ignition, and usually it's going to be in the form of a flame, a fuse, or a spark. Um, what you also see is that actually gunpowder, in a sense, is not a terribly efficient propellant, in the sense that a lot of products that are being produced are actually salts. It's not only producing gas, like carbon dioxide and nitrogen gas, it's also producing these salts, um, which in fact don't really contribute to the, to the propelling force of, of gunpowder. They are also responsible for the typical, and you, you saw it also in the very first movie I, I showed you, at the typical white clouds you see when there's a gunpowder explosion or, or combustion. And that's because it also generates salt products and they are kind of dispersed into the air like smoke. Uh, we will see later that the newer propellants, they don't generate smoke anymore. They don't generate any salt products. But our friend gunpowder uh, does, giving this beautiful uh, white uh, smoke. Now, black powder is a low explosive. What we mean by a low explosive is actually an explosive that when it combusts, when you initiate it, it will propagate. Meaning, as you see below here, if this would be a stick of, um, of gunpowder, you would ignite it here, it would start burning, the reaction would start and it would propagate further on until there is nothing left. In other words, you can actually define or observe a, a speed. How fast is the burning rate? How fast is this, this reaction front proceeding to the material? And for a low explosive, of which gunpowder is a typical example, but there are many others, it, this speed is subsonic. So slower than the speed of sound. This has some effects uh, on, on what kind of damage it can do, for example. For example, gunpowder, for that reason, cannot explode without some kind of confinement. If you would have a heap of gunpowder on your desk and you would ignite it, you would get a pretty uh, impressive uh, gust of flame, uh, lots of smoke and heat and so on, but you won't get a true explosion because the gases are generated at a speed that's still too slow to cause a shockwave. The only way to make it explode is to confine it, to put it inside, for example, a closed tube or a closed sphere or something like that, like a missile. There, the gases can't escape, the pressure will build up, and at some point, the container will just explode, giving you your shockwave. So important to remember, low explosives require confinement to explode. Does it mean that they are less powerful? Yes, but therefore not necessarily less useful. Because they are slower, they're also more useful as propellants. You can use them to propel rockets, propel bullets, something that the more quicker and the faster explosives, which we will see later, won't be able to do for you because they simply uh, go too fast. So low explosives are sometimes for that reason also called propellants because their, their prime function is to propel forward objects. Here we see an example um, of gunpowder being lit in the open to make art in this case. You see um, no explosion, simply a very rapid combustion. That's because it is a low explosive, of course. Now you are already thinking probably, so that also means there must be high explosives, right? And you are obviously correct. Um, up until now, low explosives, gunpowder, was the explosive, the only explosive known for a very long time until the 19th century. And in that um, century, a Italian scientist by the name of Asciano Sobrero, was working on some pretty interesting stuff. He was trying to react glycerin, which is a byproduct of soap manufacturing, with a mixture of nitric and sulfuric acids. He obtained an oil that was insoluble in water, which is peculiar for him because glycerin dissolves very well in water. So he decided to isolate it. He also noticed that it gave strong headaches when you ingested it. Keep in mind, this is the 19th century. Uh, we didn't have UPLC or other fancy analytical methods. So people tasted what they made. Um, he did also note that when you heated this solution, you got a violent explosion um, with a force he had never seen before. And as things went in the 19th century, what he did then was immediately call your friends, your scientific friends and say, look what I made. They would go to the lab and as he beautifully describes in his paper, he made it explode again and basically caused uh, many a, a tear and many a wound in the face of his, uh, of his friend but also typically 19th century, perhaps instead of being disheartened, 
he was very enthusiastic and published his, his results. He, however, did not really give much more thought to it. He shared his invention, he shared his, his findings with some other scientists, but he did not exploit it himself uh, later. Unbeknown to him at that time, he had actually discovered the very first high explosive in human history, namely nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin, which by the way, also acts as a, uh, as a medicine, because the reason why it gives strong headaches is because it's a, uh, uh, it, it, it makes your blood vessels uh, open when you, when you take it. So it's actually a good medicine against uh, angina pectoris. Unfortunately, also maybe, maybe a bit of a sadder anecdote um, to test this uh, property. Again, we're talking about the 19th century here, people, they gave it to a puppy um, who after severe convulsion died uh, from massive hemorrhaging, which they also documented, of course, 19th century style. Um, so the first high explosive in history had been discovered, nitroglycerin. Now, what is a high explosive? This is important, of course. A high explosive is capable of detonation. Detonation, we've talked before uh, when we were talking about gunpowder, about the deflagration, about the reaction speed that propagates through a material at, at a speed lower than the speed of sound. For a high explosive, for a detonation, this speed is actually supersonic, so faster than the speed of sound, meaning the rate of it's not really a combustion anymore, but decomposition is, is a better word. It's so fast, it's faster than the speed of sound, meaning that you won't even need confinement anymore. The inertia is so big that the energy is really so fast that you will get a shockwave in any case, even without confinement. If you have nitroglycerin as a liquid, it's a bit difficult, but if you have a solid uh, uh, high explosive, for example, you would have a heap on your desk and you would ignite it or initiate it, it would detonate, it would explode. You would get an explosion with a shockwave and it would be an unfortunate day uh, for you. Um, since this velocity, how fast this reaction front is, is, is going is so important, it's actually a figure that's used to estimate the power of an explosive. It's called the velocity of detonation, abbreviated as VOD. The higher, the faster the explosive usually means the more powerful. We'll see some, some examples later. Here we can see, for example, an exploding stick of dynamite taken with a high-speed camera. And you can see that the reaction front is already here and the gas still didn't really have time to expand completely. That is typical of the extreme speed of high explosives. Here we see an example of only about 100 grams of high explosive, unconfined in a plastic bag next to a tree. And you can immediately see the results. Huh? Shockwave is in this ripping action, very typical for high explosives. This ripping action that they have because of the formation of the shockwave, a true shockwave with high peak pressures, this is called brisance. Um, brisance means the property of a high explosive to rip apart whatever it is in contact with. We can see a beautiful example here. Um, this is an experiment where a person has filled a piece of tubing, metal tubing, with first a low explosive, like gunpowder, exploded it. Uh, what you see is, of course, the, the tube is closed and the pressure builds up. It blows apart and you see that the chunks, the pieces of pipe are relatively big. You could, I mean, reasonably even reassemble almost the, the tube in a way. They did the same thing, but with a high explosive dynamite. You see the damage pattern is totally different. All these pieces of metal are warped beyond recognition. There are many small fragments and you can't see it in this picture, but many other fragments were simply not found. This is typical for high explosives. They rip apart. They don't just give a gentle, in a way of speaking, explosion. They rip apart with whichever uh, thing that they are touching or are in contact with. This is also a way, by the way, how you can identify post-explosion, whether you were dealing with a high or a low explosive. So that is the way that explosives are classified. Low and high low explosive deflagrate. They have a slow speed uh, of propagation below the speed of sound. And the high explosives have a high speed of propagation above the speed of sound. They, they detonate. Um, one then can make a further classification between propellants and pyrotechnics like fireworks. The high explosives, however, are classified further in, in classes that are related to their sensitivity, not power, but sensitivity. Meaning primary explosives are very easy uh, to, to explode. Secondary are much harder and tertiary explosives are very hard to, to explode. We will see why this is important uh, later. But let's go back to our good friend nitroglycerin. Now nitroglycerin 
is a, a liquid explosive. Um, has a melting point of around 13 degrees. It's totally insoluble in water. It's actually extremely powerful, uh, even by today's standards. It has a velocity detonation of 8,000 meters per second. Now, to put this in perspective, this would mean that if I would have a tube of eight kilometers long, filled with nitroglycerin, and I would detonate it on one side, it would have reached the other side in one second. So you can imagine it can traverse eight kilometers in one second. What kind of energy release rate must be involved in this, in this, uh, in this molecule? It's actually, contrary to popular belief, quite um, insensitive. The, the pure material is actually quite insensitive. You shouldn't beat it with a hammer, but you can definitely uh, move it, transport it. You can even shake it gently. That's not a problem. The problem arises when it's impure, when you have traces of acid, for example, when after the synthesis it is not purified properly, then you might have a very dangerous compound on your hands that can explode even by the touch of a hand. Um, how is it made? Well, you only have to look to Sombrero's original experiments by the nitration of glycerine, which is a byproduct of soap manufacturing. Uh, it's a very simple reaction, as you can see here, also a very cheap compound uh, for that reason. We see here how it was originally done in one of Nobel's uh, factories. And this is, to me, every time I see this, a beautiful picture. Rudimentary process safety, there is so much to explain here. But um, what's important to know is the nitration of, of glycerin is extremely hazardous. The reaction itself produces a lot of heat. So the temperature will rise of the reaction mixture. If it reaches above a certain temperature, it will explode. So it's very important that when you're adding the glycerin to this mixture, you do it slow, 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 and cooling, you have to cool very well. Otherwise, your plant will go up in a big, uh, big explosion. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about uh, the early, uh, the late 19th century here. So we didn't really have computers or anything like that. So it's all to be done by hand. So you, what you see here is actually an operator. He's making nitroglycerin by literally opening valves and slowly adding the glycerin. He had to keep an eye on the temperature at all times. If the temperature rose, he had to stop immediately. If the temperature rose too much, he had to dump the contents of the reactor into ice water. If he made a mistake, it would be his last. So what did they do to improve safety? Um, also, please note the man's beautiful outfit. We don't dress operates that anymore, a beautiful bonnet, shame. This uh, interesting piece of process safety uh, here is a one-legged stool. It's a chair with only one leg. The idea be behind that being um, if you have to dose glycerin to a big reactor, it takes a long time. So there's always the ever-lasting temptation uh, of, of sleep which of course would be the last thing you ever did. So they invented this one-legged stool, uh, which is if you would fall asleep, if you would nod off, you would fall off your stool and wake up. So rudimentary process safety uh, at its best. Now, there was a small problem. Um, well, there were a couple of uh, small problems. First of all, nitroglycerin um, wasn't, wasn't very popular. Uh, it, was, it was dangerous, but also it couldn't be reliably detonated. Um, it, it was, you could, you could try to light it up with a flame, but it would just burn. You would have to burn it in a, in a bit of a confined environment so the heat could build up until it really would detonate. It, and even then it didn't always work. It wasn't really practical to use for that reason. You couldn't just put a fuse in it and make it explode. It didn't work that way. So the question didn't arose to many people, except for one, Alfred Noble. He actually, made nitroglycerin into a viable explosive by inventing the detonator. And yes, this is the same Nobel uh, that is now uh, the, let's say, the spiritual father of the Nobel Awards. Um, in fact, the Nobel Awards, all that money is actually provided by his explosives industry, uh, dynamite. So whenever you see Nobel Prizes again, you will think of me and dynamite because that is what it's all based on in the end. But um, his invention was quite uh, remarkable. Um, what he did was he devised a, a, a sort of device, a detonator, that could be ignited by a fuse where you had a small charge of black powder in a, in a small tube, so a confined environment, which if you would ignite it would cause a small explosion, and this small explosion could reliably initiate nitroglycerin. You could make this happen with a fuse, so a flame, or later on, even with electricity. So a small glowing wire would ignite the black powder, which was reliable, which would cause a small explosion, and this small explosion would then set off the nitroglycerin itself. He patented this in, in 1864. This is the original patent of Alfred Nobel, and this would be the start of his empire. 
because what he invented uh, in a sense or discovered perhaps was the explosive uh, train uh, like with black powder to ignite or to detonate uh, high explosives, you need to set it off. You need to give it a jolt. A simple flame is usually not enough. Uh, you need to, to set it off in, in some other way. And better so, uh, because if you want to make a bomb, for example, you want to have a lot of explosive usually. If all the explosive will be very sensitive to ignition, it will be very impractical to use, very dangerous. So what does the explosive train uh, basically mean is you're going to use a small amount of a sensitive explosive something that's easy to, uh, to, to, to explode, for example, in Nobel's invention, uh, black powder, and you're going to use that energy, that small jolt of energy to set off the next charge, which could be your main charge or an intermediate charge, which will then generate more energy to in the end detonate your entire block or your entire bomb of high explosive. And that is also to this day how we um, explode high explosives using a detonator. Of course, the modern detonators look a little bit different. They also contain high explosive. Huh? You can see the two varieties here. You either have one which still work with a sort of rudimentary fuse, huh, where you also reach some sort of black powder um, and you ignite and you detonate it. Or of course, the very uh, common electrical ones. It's better to control. You basically have a heated wire that heats up because of the electricity that ignites a charge of black powder on Back in the days, nowadays it's different, uh, more reliable components, which will make a flame, the flame which will set off the uh, sensitive explosive uh, in here. So you'll be basically using sensitive explosives to set off the less sensitive explosive. Nobel started with, oops, a bit too fast. Nobel started with uh, black powder, but later on, um, a, uh, a jolly fellow called Johann Kunkel von Löwenstein discovered um, a, a peculiar compound called mercury fulminates, a mercury salt um, that is incredibly shock, friction, and spark sensitive, and also sensitive to flame. It's also highly toxic. It was discovered right in the 17th century, but considered no more than a curiosity. Um, later on, Alfred Nobel um, caught on to this uh, compound because it was much more powerful than, uh, than gunpowder, and he used it in his first primary explosive uh, detonator. The Physics behind it are a little bit more complicated. What's happened? What's happening with this primary explosive here is basically, in this case, a small energy like a flame or a spark will cause this material to combust. So it makes a flame. But the property of this primary explosive, which is, I mean, there are others like it, that typically for a primary explosive, this flame will very rapidly propagate with minimal confinement into a detonation wave. So very powerful, very fast wave. And that is what makes mercury fulminate so interesting and has also been used as a detonator for a very long time until the azides came along, which we will see later. Mercury fulminate was made from uh, obviously mercury and nitric acid in a very dangerous process. You can see here how it was done industrially. Um, none of these reactors are larger than 20 liters for the simple reason that if then one exploded, it was only 20 liters uh, and it would only kill maybe one or two people and not the whole plant would go up in flames because these are very dangerous compounds. Uh, they, are, they are capable of detonation, so of the high explosive uh, energy release very fast, but they are also very sensitive. So you don't want to use a lot of this uh, stuff and in fact, as little as possible. Here we see an example, this is mercury filament with a flame. Uh, almost no confinement, you see a rapid flash. It didn't have time to transition to detonation. We will see the same uh, compound now in a small test tube. Uh, so not a lot of confinement, and it's not a lot of compound either, maybe 10, 20 milligrams. Um, just a little bit of confinement, enough for it to transition to detonation, which we will see here. You hear it, you see it. This was a deflagration to detonation transfer or uh, progress. So a peculiar property of these primary explosives. Um, mercury fulminate is no longer in use because it's, well, first of all, very sensitive, too sensitive for modern use, but also obviously it's highly toxic, not just the compound itself, but also its byproducts, namely mercury. Um, but let's go back to nitroglycerin. So at that moment, uh, in time, Alfred Nobel had made sure it could be reliably initiated. It was very useful. But there were still concerns about safety. I remember what I said, um, pure nitroglycerin is relatively uh, insensitive, relatively, I should say, but impure isn't. 
And if it's since it's a liquid, it also it easily leaks. It's not a very pleasant material to work with, uh, being a liquid. Uh, it's nicely demonstrated also here. Uh, what you see here is an atrisrum plant um, where a so-called angel buggy is at work. So at some point, an operator has to move the nitroglycerin from the uh, plant to for further progress. This was so dangerous, it was done by one person in a sort of wheelbarrow that he had to roll around. He was always alone on a road where there were no people or um, any other pieces of plant equipment nearby in case he would explode. So you can imagine this man isn't happy. And does he look happy? He does not look happy. Nitroglycerin was and is a relatively dangerous compound to work with, especially in pure form. Um, we can see here, by the way, a beautiful still of an nitroglycerin factory of Nobel uh, somewhere outside of, of Stockholm. In fact, it should be noted that uh, Alfred Nobel actually lost his brother Emil um, to an explosion of a nitroglycerin plant. So he uh, surely made his sacrifices. Then came his second. Uh, uh, invention. So Alfred Nobel until then had made the discovery or the invention of the detonator, making that glycerin useful as a blasting compound, um, but still dangerous. His true breakthrough and the start of his huge uh, empire was a means to stabilize that glycerin itself. And to do that, he used an absorbent. He absorbed this liquid into kieselgur, which is a kind of inert carrier, making a kneadable, so you could, you could almost knead it, you could make it into shapes and into kind of paste. This is, of course, the very well-known dynamite. He would then wrap this in, in, in paper, and this would be a full, uh, useful explosive device. Detonator would be inside. You can see a, a uh, depiction here, cut in half. Uh, this is the dynamite, a kind of paste almost, uh, with nitroglycerin in there, detonator, and a fuse uh, on the outside. And this was a very handy, very useful way uh, to use for the first time high explosives in a very reliable and, and relatively safe uh, way. I say relatively safe, it's still nitroglycerin. Um, dynamite has the unfortunate property that it sweats. If it stays, especially at high temperature or for a very long time, nitroglycerin will slowly start to separate from the kieselgur and escape from its, its, uh, its package, which as you can imagine, is very unfortunate. Um, but this did totally revolutionize uh, the world, um, not just in terms of, of warfare, but also in terms of mining of civil applications, because before that gunpowder was the only way uh, to really do civil blasting, like mining and so on. With this, you could do much, much more uh, for very cheap as well. So very quickly, black powder became obsolete uh, for blasting, not for guns, it stayed uh, useful for guns for quite a long time, as we will see later. Um, but dynamite truly revolutionized uh, the explosive world. For the first time, humankind could harness the high explosives, uh, the really powerful uh, version. Meanwhile, um, a man called Schönbein, um, a teacher originally, uh, later on a professor, made a discovery in his kitchen. Um, he had the tendency to not leave his work at the university, but continue in the confines of his own home. Uh, in his kitchen, he would do chemistry experiments involving strong, dangerous acids to the dismay of his wife. And one fateful day, he had accidentally spilled a mixture of nitric and sulfuric acids onto his wife's cotton apron. To hide this fact that he had uh, stained it, he tried to dry it uh, on a heater and notice that it at some point spontaneously caught fire, burning without any residue of smoke, um, which he found, of course, very uh, interesting. He then went on to investigate further, and he actually discovered um, that you could nitrate uh, cotton or cellulose. And this, is the, this is the man right here. You can see his implements of the trade in the back. He had discovered nitrocellulose. Uh, cellulose, as you know, is a plant-like material. Uh, it's, it's, it's easily found, can be made from wood and so forth. Um, it can be nitrated, actually has a lot of uh, hydroxy groups you can see here. It can be nitrated to several uh, forms. You obtain a white powder that's actually almost indistinguishable from normal cotton. If you would nitrate a piece of paper, for example, after nitration, if it's done correctly, it will still look the same. Uh, so it still has the, the outlook and feel of normal uh, of cotton. 
at the beginning, Schoenbein was, like, was, was really uh, very enthusiastic. He thought this is going to be a great discovery. I'm going to make a lot of money on it, perhaps in a similar trend as, uh, as, as Alfred. But unfortunately, uh, because his, the properties looked, at first glance, the properties looked great. Huh? There are no solid products, and not like with gunpowder, for example. You don't have this nasty smoke that also clogs barrels, that, that corrodes, and so forth. It also seemed to be much stronger than uh, gunpowder. But um, after he sold the patent and the first manufacturing plant um, started going, it immediately went pretty bad. Uh, it exploded. And it was attempted several times, but the industry just kept being plagued by unfortunate accidents, uh, taking the lives of many people. And at some point, the interest in nitrocellulose simply declined. It was deemed too unsafe uh, to use. Here we can see nitrocellulose, as you can see, super quick combustion, no smoke, clearly a low explosive, uh, it, it, it deflagrates. Um, but as said before, unfortunately, uh, too un deemed too unsafe to use. However, chemists being chemists, uh, didn't leave it at that. And a man called Abel uh, started to investigate and he found actually that the reason why the nitrocellulose was so unstable was not because of its intrinsic properties, but because the manufacturing process was just bad, uh, especially the washing. Nitrocellulose becomes unstable if there is traces of acid present. And since it's made from a mixture of strong acid, that means that if you don't wash it very, very thoroughly afterwards, um, you will have always traces of acid in it, which will destabilize. And at some point, destabilize enough that it can combust uh, very easily. It is not so trivial to just wash it because the cellulose is usually pulp, and it's not so easy to really get and, and rinse it very properly. But Abel invented a process that was also easily scalable, that really um, improved the way that the, the, the pulp was, uh, was washed. And this process was further improved later in the early 20th century by Thompson and produced the first real useful nitrocellulose, a stable and very powerful material. However, we're still not there. It was still not replacing gunpowder at that time. The reason was it was too powerful. It was too fast. Nitrocellulose being derived from cellulose kept the texture of cellulose, which is rather, relatively porous. It's too fast. When you ignite it, it burns so fast that traditional guns would simply explode. It wouldn't have good ballistic properties. You could go and work with collagen, which is a, a lower nitrated form, but that was too irregular and that would cause also bad ballistic properties. It took until almost uh, the end of the 19th century for the first smokeless powder to be made. Smokeless powder, again, we see Noble uh, being on the scene here, but he was certainly not the only one. Uh, Abel was also there uh, and also some uh, French scientists. They basically um, dissolved the nitrocellulose or partially dissolved it using a solvent. And you could you would make a sort of plastic almost, a plastic paste that you could extrude. And this was interesting because if you could extrude it, it would no longer be porous. It would be like a hard material. It would basically extrude like spaghetti almost. Like if you have Play-Doh, like my daughter has, you push it through, you have these long strings. It could then be cut to appropriate sizes, which is really, really good because that is something you need uh, if you want to have good ballistic properties. Depending on the gun, depending on the caliber, you would require different size, different burning rates, which could be done now. One could extrude this powder as a sign of spaghetti and you could cut it to the desired length. Uh, it was then also discovered that this was far superior to gunpowder. It caused less fouling. It was much more powerful. This was the future. You can see here how it looks. And this is the uh, invention that would go into the First World War, namely cordite. Uh, cordite is also a, a form of smokeless powder where one also adds Vaseline. The Vaseline stabilizes the, uh, further stabilizes the nitrocellulose composition and also reduces the burning rate somewhat, resulting in better ballistic properties. This is actually a bullet, a, a British 303 uh, round, as you can see here. Um, the cordite actually, and here you can see very clearly, this is how the bullet was filled, not with the kind of fine grains, but with almost spaghetti-like uh, pieces. This was the cordite. And the reason why it's in such shape is to slow the burning rate down sufficiently to have a good bullet without exploding the gun, basically. And here we see a old uh, manufacturing plant where they are basically nitrating a wood pulp. And this is an extruder. You can see the spaghetti-like nitro, uh, sorry, cordite coming out, ready to be cut 
into uh, appropriate um, size. Nitrocellulose was invented just in time for one of the great upsetting events uh, in, in, in history, namely uh, World War I. In World War I, high explosives were used for the first time on a grand, on a grand scale. Uh, and of course, one of the most uh, prolific uses was in shells. Shells, high explosive uh, ammunition. World War I was kind of, uh, let's say, symbolized by a discrepancy between the old and the new. On the one hand, we had a lot of new technological advances in warfare, the high explosives, uh, weapons like uh, shells, where you basically have, you can compare it to an enormous bullet that propels not just a, a inert metal uh, bullet, but actually a projectile filled with high explosives that explodes upon impact. Um, which is, of course, an extremely powerful weapon. We also had new and advanced guns, like machine guns, and, of course, not to be underestimated, mass production. We, not only did we have these advanced weapons, we could produce them en masse. Um, the tactics, on the other hand, were lagging behind. I remember these massive charges into machine gun fire, um, trench warfare, and so on. We had a big discrepancy between the tactics and the technology resulting in, of course, massive loss of life. High explosives were a very important part of World War I. They wreaked havoc. Um, fortresses that, that were previously determined to be impenetrable were destroyed within days using high explosive uh, artillery and ordnance. Um, and they were really uh, almost a revelation in, in, in warfare. Um, also interesting um, that actually these weapons of war were made by the gentle hands of women. Um, what you can see here is, is um, a, a munition factory in the UK during World War I. Since all the men or all capable men were at the front, there was an acute lack of, uh, of workers in the plants uh, to make all these mass-produced powerful weapons. And so the duty came to the women who were actually usually working in these, uh, in these plants, producing uh, the weapons uh, that would uh, be propelled by their husbands and brothers and fathers. Among these new high explosives uh, that were used in World War I, dynamite was not really one of them. Dynamite is actually a little bit too sensitive even to be used uh, in warfare. If you try to shoot it using artillery, it would probably explode in the barrel simply due to the shock of being propelled. There was a need for new explosives. One of those explosives that filled the gap was picric acid. I think everybody probably has heard of this uh, very beautiful um, solids. It has a beautiful yellow crystal, some of the beautiful, most beautiful crystals you will have ever seen. Uh, it's, it's relatively powerful. Um, it was actually discovered a long time ago and uses a very powerful yellow dye. It stains everything completely canary yellow, including your skin, uh, which will need to be washed, I mean, which you can't even wash off. Your skin really needs to uh, come off by itself before you can use uh, the, uh, the yellow color. Um, Sprengel, however, a German scientist, discovered in 1871 that this dye also had high explosive properties. The reason why it took so long is because picric acid is actually quite unsensitive. I mean, you need a detonator or very strong shock to set it off, which is one of the reasons why it was very useful to be used in shells uh, and as artillery. It was called lidite uh, in, in the UK, for example, or much more beautiful in German would be Granatfüllung 88. Um, that is as scary as it sounds. Um, so picric acid was very useful, the ha but it had some unfortunate properties. The first being is very toxic. Um, so using it, producing it was not the most pleasant uh, of things, but perhaps even more concerning, it's a strong acid. As every chemist will see from the structure, it's a phenol with a lot of electron growing groups. It's extremely acidic, which means it gave corrosion, uh, it gave corrosion problems. That would be unfortunate, but even more unfortunate is that these, the, this corrosion caused the formation of metal picrates, um, the products of this corrosion, which are extremely sensitive primary explosives. So you can imagine that a insensitive explosive that has the capacity to create its own primary explosive, in a sense, its own detonator over time by corrosion, is not a very pleasant, uh, pleasant compound. It's cheap to produce, though. can be easily made from phenol, which is a commodity chemical available in bulk, you have to sulfonate it a little bit, and then our traditional nitration to make our beautiful uh, yellow crystals. It can also still be found in, um, in, um, in some labs of the past because it's also very useful 
uh, to crystallize some organic compounds. Um, the picric acid is the first uh, explosive. It was actually not used for a very long time uh, because of these unfortunate properties of being acidic and very toxic. And nevertheless, it's very interesting from a historical point of view. We then move on, of course, to um, the other grandfather of uh, explosives, which is trinitrotoluene or TNT. I guess everybody has heard of this. I think if anybody mentions explosives to a layman, TNT is the first thing that comes to mind. And there are probably, I um, mean, incredible amount of misconceptions about TNT. The first being that it's very sensitive. It is absolutely not. It's quite insensitive, actually. Uh, it's very hard to detonate it. You really need a detonator uh, detonate it, which of course makes it perfect for use in shelling and artillery. But another very good property of TNT is its low melting point, only 81 degrees, meaning boiling water can melt it. And that makes it interesting from a industry perspective. The reason being, you could melt and cast this. Up until now, the other explosives like picric acid, you can't melt it because when you try to melt it, it will explode or at least degrade. So actually, if you wanted to fill a shell with picric acid, you had to literally stomp it down using a, a broomstick or something and fill the shell, stomping it down until your shell was full. Not so with TNT. With TNT, you could melt it beforehand safely and then pour it into a shell, like filling a glass of water. That made it, of course, much easier and much faster to fill these uh, these weapons. So also on the reason about TNT is still in, in use. It's also a very stable explosive. It's not acidic. It's actually a, a great, a very stable, a workhorse of, uh, of the military. Still to this day, TNT is used a lot in all sorts of military applications. Like some of its uh, compatriots, high explosives, it also discovered long before it was known to be an explosive. So only in 19, uh, 1891, it was truly recognized that this was a powerful and very useful uh, explosive. It's made, again, from a commodity chemical, toluene, which you can get from uh, crude oil in a three-step nitration, um, which is, I mean, it seems complicated, but on industrial scale, it's very cheap to do this, um, and you can make your, your compounds relatively Again, we see here um, the ladies filling up the shells uh, with, uh, with TNT. Also interesting, perhaps, for the chemists among us um, who think flow chemistry is a very innovative thing, um, I should mention that um, denitrotoluene has been produced in flow since World War II. Um, so it's, sorry, since World War I already, between uh, World War I and World War II, because the process is not without risk to improve the safety uh, qualities, it's produced continuously, meaning it's not a single reactor, it's basically being pumped out continuously uh, as it goes. Now, TNT, how powerful is it really? Um, I'll give you some, an idea. So this is five kilograms TNT in a uh, hopefully old car. You see the explosion, um, very, very powerful, uh, this explosive. And we see 50 kilograms TNT because why not in a house? A couple of things that you might have noticed, the brisons. Eh? You see it's, it's ripping apart with whichever it, container it is in, whether it's a car or a house. You saw the house rips to shreds. You saw the car rip to shreds as well. Typical behavior for a high explosive. And also notice, especially with the house, no, almost no fire, and the smoke is only coming from the um, the other items that are present in, in the confinement. So typical for, for a high explosive. Some lag. Um, another important one is ammonium nitrate. I think ammonium nitrate now also has the eye of the public uh, for many reasons. One being probably, of course, um, our not so good friend Anders Breivik and his attack. It's, it's, it's used by uh, terrorists. Uh, quite often, um, but also because of the disaster in Beirut, of course. This is a commodity chemical, a very important fertilizer, very, very important, produced on tons and tons and tons scale uh, annually. Um, it's actually, as an explosive, it's not that great, actually. It's hygroscopic, meaning it picks up water from the air, rendering it inert, which is a very uh, it's not a nice property to have for an explosive. It's not very powerful. Uh, it's actually almost barely a high explosive, but, and this is the most important thing, it's first of all, very insensitive, which is good, but it's especially incredibly, incredibly cheap. Um, you can get kilos and kilos of it for only a couple of euros. So it's uh, on bulk, of course. So 
it was used very often in war to dilute basically um, other more valuable explosives, especially near the end of the war when TNT, pink acid and so on, became in short supply. It would be used to complement the explosives being added as a kind of filler that still had some power instead of adding an inert filler. It is almost always used as a mixture, never pure. Huh? A typical one, for example, is Amatol, um, where it's mixed with TNT, uh, molten, uh, to create a kind of adulterated TNT that's still powerful enough for most applications, but much cheaper than pure TNT. But you have a whole slew of other um, compositions as well, like ammonal with um, aluminium powder, schneiderite, asphalite with nitromethane, and so forth. Uh, sorry, hydrazine and so forth. Kinepak with nitromethane, and so forth. And of course, ANFO, which is relatively recent, um, where you simply add a fuel like diesel, um, a very low power explosive, not used in the military, but still used a lot for civil blasting to this day. The reason for that being, again, cheap. It's extremely cheap. You can literally get nitro uh, ammonium nitrate explosives by the uh, truckload. And new recent innovations make kind of slurries out of it, uh, viscous slurries that are perfect to put, for example, in a drill hole. You can just fill it up with explosive, with uh, ammonium nitrate explosive. Not very powerful, but plentiful. So that is why it's also, again, to this day, used a lot, especially in the civil, um, in the civil industry for explosives. Unfortunately, it's also known for its industrial accidents. Uh, I think everybody remembers the explosion in Beirut. That was ammonium nitrate uh, stored. I said it's very insensitive. That is definitely true from military perspective, but if you would expose it to very high temperatures, like say a large fire in a confined environment for a very long time, at some point it will start decomposing, which can lead to a chain reaction, um, which will lead eventually to a detonation, which is also what happened in, uh, in Texas in 2013 in a fertilizer storage, where about seven and a half to 10 tons exploded. You can see here the fire um, and the detonation. Seven and a half tons of ammonium nitrates God almighty, indeed. So um, we see here uh, the, 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 the danger of this, um, of this, well, common fertilizer, uh, let's say. Very good. We're moving on um, to the Second uh, World War, another age uh, of destruction. And here, again, high explosives played an important role as the science of this explosive was refined even more. Um, there was a need for it as well. What was needed were explosives that had higher velocities, detonation, higher power, and especially there was a need for anti-tank weapons, um, especially infantry portable anti-tank weapons. Uh, tanks were becoming more important and they needed a way to destroy them by a single foot soldier, for example. And again, explosives came to the rescue. Also improved manufacturing methods, allowing explosives that previously were just an oddity to be produced on larger scale were, uh, were very important. And the theoretical models that we've forgotten, like Zelda Witch and Neumann Döring theory, uh, which allowed the design of, of new uh, weapons, of which you will see one later. And not to forget, um, because a physicist always likes to brag about their nuclear weapons, but chemical explosives play a vital role in, in nuclear weapons. And in fact, you can see an, a kind of implosion type nuclear bomb, a very powerful version, is only possible thanks to a very complicated uh, and theoretically not so uh, trivial formation of these explosive lenses. So actually this uh, fissile material in the center is actually surrounded by highly complicated, very technologically advanced explosives uh, configuration. So to make a nuclear bomb, you need chemical explosives to get your uh, compression of your fissile material up to the critical mass. So again, there, um, explosives played an important role also in the Manhattan Project. The first uh, innovation would be lead azide. Um, there was a need to replace mercury fulminate. Uh, mercury fulminate was capricious, uh, it was a bit sensitive, but especially it was very toxic. And also when it exploded, it, it gave uh, contamination which may sound strange, but um, that people would care about it, but people did. Uh, the mercury, not very, not very interesting. Um, luckily here, um, at around 1891, Curtius discovered that if you'd made the azide salt of lead, you got a very good initiating explosive. Um, lead azide is powerful, 
more powerful than mercury fulminate, for example, but much less sensitive. Um, especially if you dextrinate it, meaning you add dextrose to it, it's a kind of phlegmatizing almost. Um, not, not much, a little bit to make the powder free flowing, but much less sensitive. So it had a very strong, a very good efficiency of initiation, meaning you, need, you don't need a lot to initiate the common high explosives. It's very storage stable, which is very good. It's also very cheap, which is of course of vital importance. Um, it is, for that reason, still widely used today, although it's also falling out of favor because it still contains this very unfortunate uh, lead, which is, of course, not very interesting from an environmental perspective. And if you're wondering, yes, there are environmental concerns with high explosives as you are shelling your opponent. It's good to think about the environment that you later want to conquer, I suppose. Um, the synthesis, of course, is extremely easy. Um, I guess anybody with a basic chemistry knowledge uh, background will realize it can be simply made from a precipitation reaction between sodium azide and a lead salt because uh, lead azide isn't water soluble so it will simply precipitate from solution uh, and is made to this day in that way. Another extremely extremely important explosive that only really got traction in World War II is RDX, uh, Research Department Explosive. Um, this white solid, uh, white crystalline solid, is a very powerful explosive. Uh, it's much more powerful than TNT. It's also relatively unsensitive. Uh, you need to make a, a, a strong effort to, to get it to detonate. It was discovered already uh, before World War I, but it took a while for a good manufacturing process to be in place to manufacture this reliably on large scale, which is the reason why it wasn't used in World War I. It's often used as a mixture, for example, Composition B or Comp B, uh, used a lot in World War I with TNT, the reason being it's melt castable. It's stronger than pure TNT, but you can still fill up your shells with it easily. Torpex was also used, where it was used with TNT and aluminium, very powerful mixture. And of course, C4, how could I forget? Um, I guess very prevalent in movies and uh, video games uh, worldwide, where it's mixed with a plasticizer like polyisobutylene, um, making a kind of kneadable mass that you can adapt to your needs on the fly. Um, you can see it here, typical C4 block, aerial bombs and so forth. It is still one of the most, most widely used explosives today. Um, for sure in any military uh, worldwide. The synthesis is, the mechanism is relatively complicated. The synthesis itself is relatively simple. One starts from hexamine, uh, which can be made from uh, ammonia and formaldehyde. And one simply nitrates it uh, in a rather, I mean, operationally complex procedure to get after some um, cleavage reactions, the RDX, which is a very beautiful symmetrical molecule, as you can see. So RDX is extremely important even to this uh, day as a military explosive. The second one, or the third one is uh, poly, uh, sorry, um, uh, PETN, which is an important uh, nitro ester. It looks perhaps at first glance a little bit nitroglycerin, although not quite. It's also very powerful, as powerful as RDX. It's a little bit more sensitive, um, but one of its great advantages, it's very easy to initiate. So while it's not so sensitive to friction or impact, which is bad, it's very sensitive to initiation by a detonator. So it's the perfect booster explosive. Um, and it's also used for that purpose relatively uh, often. Also again, to this day, it's also used sometimes in mixtures, Semtex, for example, another, um, another Hollywood favorite eh, where it's mixed with RDX and a plasticizer. So you have a kneadable mass. Semtex is a little bit more powerful than C4. And especially easier to initiate. And one of the reasons also why it got a kind of bad name is because in the beginning when it was made, it was almost undetectable um, because it had no volatile compounds. Uh, at some point, um, Czech Republic, where Semtex was made, was forced uh, by, uh, by other governments to include on purpose a small amount of a volatile, easy to detect tagant, as they call it, into the procedure, into the manufacturing process of Semtex to make it more easily um, detected at airports and so forth. Um, it's used a lot in different applications like detonation core, detonation sheet, um, as you can see here, all tools for the demolition man to make it a bit more easy. Again, since this is very straightforward, uh, a simple Canizaro reaction between um, ethanol, so acetaldehyde and formaldehyde, making pentaerythritol, which will then nitrate into pentaerythritol tetranitrate, which is a, uh, a white salt. The, the, explosive that we have been talking about. So PETN, also an important explosive. HMX then um, was actually not used during World War II. It was known already uh, during uh, 
actually before World 2, but it was considered to be an impurity of RDX. It's made if the conditions are not perfect. It was much more powerful than RDX, but also much more sensitive. So it wasn't really uh, a desired uh, compound to have, but it, gains, it gained a lot of attention lately, actually after World War II uh, in the 80s, 70s, because new technology ar arose that could be used to make it less sensitive. And therefore you could still use the incredibly strong power of HMX, but still have the low sensitivity. And it's actually now being used in some of the most advanced warheads uh, in, in current day military. So HMX, also an interesting molecule, beautifully symmetric, as you can, as you can see. Um, going forwards, we have the anti-tank weapons. Um, this is a beautiful example, in my opinion, of the marriage or the, the intertwining of physics and chemistry, uh, using the physics of shockwave theory and the chemistry of explosives to make a new sort of weapon with peculiar properties. Here we see a, a, uh, a tank hit by a Panzerfaust, a armor piercing, uh, sorry, an anti-tank round. You see this peculiar hole uh, that was made. So the Panzerfaust is basically an explosive weapon that made use of the shaped charge or the uh, Monroe-Neumann uh, effect. Um, we will see the physics behind it later, but what it basically does is this focuses the explosive energy into a very small area, allowing it to penetrate into evenly, even heavily fortified targets. Shaped charges are something that were discovered by um, Monroe, Monroe in, uh, in the States and Neumann in Germany almost at the same time. What they discovered was this. If you have an explosive, a high explosive, you put it on a metal plate and you detonate it, most of the energy is directed away from the heavy uh, metal mass. This is also known as the Misenay Chardin effect. This was, this was known uh, because it's, it's looking for the, the, the way of least resistance. However, Monroe noticed if you make a cavity in the explosive uh, above where the, the target in this case is, he saw deeper penetration into the target, which was strange because in the end you're using less explosive actually. You're making a hole in the same in the explosive, removing explosive, yet producing a stronger effect in the target uh, right beneath it. The reason behind that is actually that there is a physical effect at play. He also noticed that if you then would not just leave it a, a bare explosive, but you would actually put it in, in a liner, it's called, so a piece of metal, for example, to cover this hole on the inside, the effect is even stronger. So what's happening here? Um, in fact, the shock waves, you ignite the, uh, or you initiate, detonate the explosive on the top, the shockwave passes through the material, compresses, the shockwaves meet actually in the center, in this cavity, and they reinforce each other, sending out, compressing the, the, the liner in this case, and sending it out like a kind of spear, a jet and a slug as it's called. The velocities uh, of these jets are incredibly high, up to 10,000 meters per second, that does extreme. At such speeds, they create so much energy in such a small uh, area that metal acts almost like a liquid. And that's why we get these deep uh, penetrating effects. They also note that if you then have a, a standoff, so you take the explosive a little bit away from the surface, you could even get deeper. That's of course, because you give the jets more time uh, to form. So this is a shape charge effect. It's actually the two shock waves colliding inside this, this, this hollow, squirting out a jet of pure uh, metal in this case. Of course, as soon as it was discovered, it was immediately weaponized to make anti-tank weapons. Um, you can see here clearly, this is the Panzerfaust. Um, you can see clearly this hollow shape, and this is actually just a hollow uh, dud, uh, just a spacer. You can see clearly, the, again, the shaped charge uh, uh, form here, of course, meant to penetrate, cause a jet to form and penetrate a tank. The RPG, of course, uh, also very well known. Again, you see here this kind of conical, um, form of a uh, of an explosive. Nowadays, um, you also see it sometimes or hear from it as the EFP, an explosive form penetrator in war zones like Iraq, where they actually take it uh, one step back and they make the liner less a bit more shallow, but using it to propel it almost like a semi-molten slug of metal which can be projected over larger distances like 20 30 meters it's useful to for example destroy armored vehicles from a short distance like this american humvee however it's not all death and destruction uh, because shape charges are also used for more scientific purposes like you can see here uh, this is the hayabusa 2 a recent 
um, a, a satellite that was meant to investigate the Ryugu um, uh, meteor or space object. It wanted to make a hole in the uh, meteor to get a sample of the interior. And to do that, it used actually a shaped charge of about two kilograms um, with a copper uh, liner. And it used HMX as the explosive. So it's not all death and destruction. Uh, here you can see a shaped charge in action. It's right here, very small. This is a vault, uh, a vault door made from metal, of course. You will see it detonate and you saw how fast this jet uh, is shooting simply straight through this vault door as if it wasn't there into this barrel of water. And the speed is incredible. You can see it's so fast, the water, the objects around don't even have a chance to react. Their inertia is too big. That's how fast this jet is being projected. Even the shockwave is running behind. You see then afterwards, suddenly everything starts to move, but the jet has already done its grim business. Very good. Moving on to the future, um, obviously explosive chemistry is a science. And like any science, it doesn't stop. It just keeps going. Um, of course, also in the new um, battlefields of today and tomorrow, the requirements are a little bit different. Um, however, we are still looking for high power. We're looking for high density. The reason for that is high density means you can pack more explosive in a smaller space, like a missile, which obviously is nice. But um, very important nowadays, it needs to have a low sensitivity. Uh, um, the military is very wary um, due to past experiences of their own munitions detonating or exploding, for example, because of being hit by an enemy attack or due to sheer chance. So it's very important that the munitions of the future are very low sensitive and only explode when needed. So they, they need to be low sensitive, but they also need to be able to be reliably exploded when needed. So this is a kind of a tall order, right? Um, what's also important is, you know, the green wave hits everybody, including explosive scientists. It needs to be a bit more environmentally free. So no, no lead and so forth. There are also some specialized functions that are required, like agent defeat weapons, which are particularly meant to destroy, um, for example, biological weapons. They will contain, for example, fluorides in the explosive uh, molecule to, to generate uh, fluorine uh, uh, during the explosion to destroy um, biological um, entities. Of course, the chemists seeing all this will rise to the challenge with a new slew of powerful molecules. The first and perhaps most important one is um, Hexanitro isoaza um, which is a very, I mean, in terms of explosives, a very recent discovery. It's as old as I am, uh, also known as CL20. Um, it's a white solid. It's very powerful. Uh, up until uh, uh, relatively recently, the most powerful uh, non-commercial explosive. Uh, it's it's. Uh, you can see here the difference between a, um, a, a shaped charge with 30 grams of HMX, the most powerful explosive known up until then, and the same amount of HNIW. And you can see that it penetrates much further uh, for the same amount of explosive. This is a powerful explosive. The only problem, while it's not being adopted much more, is the synthesis is relatively complex. It's a multi-step synthesis. This is only one of them. There are others. And the price is high. Uh, it's about 1,000 euro per kilogram, which is prohibitively expensive for military explosive because you need tons of it. Uh, you can't afford to, to have such explosive that's expensive. So there's a lot of work being done now on pushing down the price of this, uh, of this material. At the moment, there are some companies that produce it commercially, so it is ongoing, but it's still relatively um, exotic. Uh, it's only used for a few very special applications. But it's expected in the future, this would be uh, one of the explosives of the future. TINAS, uh, tranitroazetidine, uh, also an, an interesting explosive, much more powerful than TNT, but also melt castable. This is a requirement of the army as well. An explosive that could replace TNT, still being melt castable, so you can easily use it to fill shells, but more powerful. And TINAS is up to the challenge. Unfortunately, like the previous one, since this is relatively long, complex, and therefore, again, expensive, which is why it's not being used uh, at the moment until a better process is in place. Uh, another interesting thing, um, going a bit away from the organic chemistry perhaps, are the metastable intermolecular composites, also known as nanothermites. Basically, it's a very intimate mixture of nanoparticles of a strong oxidant, or an oxidant like uh, iron oxide, and a, a reactive metal like aluminum, uh, which termite, I think everybody knows, uh, it's a very strong reaction, a lot of energy being released. It's relatively slow because the particles are big, but here, using modern um, um, nanochemistry, 
they get the particles down so so small that the that the reaction speeds up and could theoretically increase to almost explosive um, uh, speeds. With the big difference that the energy released here is tremendous. So these are very interesting, uh, also as propellants, for example. At the moment, though, they're not really um, they're not really used. There are some problems. Either they're not sensitive enough, or they're very sensitive, which is of course extremely dangerous. But these are for now only a a novelty in literature, but um, who knows what the future may bring. And then we have a whole slew of fancy new molecules, uh, high energy density materials, as they are called, one looking more exotic than the other, very interesting from a theoretical perspective, but um, as you may remember, until they, uh, I mean, until they can be made very cheaply, it's very unlikely they will be adopted by the military because they may be very good, but if they are very expensive to make, and some of them are extremely expensive to make, they are not very useful uh, to be used as a bulk chemical. One oddity I don't want to uh, deny you is this octanitrocubane, which is as crazy as it looks. Um, it is probably the most, um, the most powerful chemical explosive known to man to date. Um, the only problem is it is more expensive than gold. Uh, the synthesis to make this uh, complex molecule is incredibly long, involving some very exotic chemistry, and um, meaning that it is actually almost, I mean, it's so expensive that it's almost infeasible to make this even on the kilogram scale. Um, there are some ongoing research to make it cheaper, but at the moment, and people have been working on it for quite some years, this has not been achieved uh, yet. In addition, it also has a lot of polymorphs, making it even more complicated. But probably you're looking at the most powerful uh, chemical explosive known to man here. Another interesting development are the insensitive high explosives. Like I said, uh, the military also wants explosives that are extremely insensitive. Uh, that can also be used for things like nuclear weapons, because remember, all nuclear weapons, they use chemical explosives. You don't want to use a chemical explosive that if somebody shoots a bullet at it, your, your nuclear weapon will go off. So there is a need there for very insensitive explosives. The ATB, uh, trimino trinitrobenzene, for example, is such an explosive. It's already commercial since the 1970s, so it's not that new. Um, but it's 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 expensive. But for some niche applications like nuclear weapons or um, some explosive um, bolts uh, used in outer space, this still has some uses. Uh, it's made in a in a uh, nitration emanation step. Very, a very stable explosive. You can shoot bullets in it, it won't budge. You really need a strong initiation to get this one uh, to fire off. We have NTO, nitro tetrazolon, uh, also a new explosive, uh, 85, very powerful, um, also very insensitive. Unfortunately, a little bit expensive, although people are very interested. There's a lot of research ongoing uh, and, and qualifications ongoing in the military. Unfortunately, most of them are classified. But I think NTO stands a good chance of being used in the future. The synthesis is, is at least shorter than most other advanced molecules. So I think this may stand a chance. FOX7, beautiful name, beautiful molecule as well. Also very powerful, very insensitive. So it looks like a great contender. Unfortunately, expensive as well. Um, this molecule looks simple, but the synthesis surely is not. Um, going on to a bit more technology. I'm going over a bit faster here because I see time is unfortunately ticking, um, but an important uh, new development are the PBXs, the plastic bonded explosives. This is basically, you're desensitizing the explosive by mixing it with a, a plastic, and you're making also in that way a piece of explosive that is easy to mold, that you can extrude, and so forth. So this is very interesting, and a lot of work is being done on this using things like HMX or CL20, so also explosives that are actually in their pure form too sensitive to be used can now be used by making these PBXs out of it. And they will load it in, in things like the Sidewinder rocket, for example, a very, very uh, interesting application. A lot of work is being done on this, mostly because it uses explosives the military already knows very well in terms of stability, and you're just changing the, the, the matrix in which it is in. And another important development here is they're using not just inert plastics, but also polymers that are energetic themselves. It actually can contribute to the explosive power instead of just being a, an inert filler. So a very active bristling field, uh, the PBX uh, field. This brings us to the last part uh, of this talk, uh, perhaps a bit less um, um, beautiful. That is, of course, explosives being used as weapons of, of terror. Huh? Um, such a great power in the hands of man um, is, of course, very tempting for those with bad intentions. Um, 
and obviously the explosives also the the the, the psychological uh, aspect of it is is of course also very very important so it is a choice weapon um, for terrorism uh, and insurrection worldwide but what is a bomb actually made of uh, or to put it more correctly, we're talking about there, an improvised explosive device, an EAD, a homemade bomb, an improvised bomb, in other words. Uh, because you can have explosive, but explosive alone doesn't make a bomb. Uh, you need to have the device, the entire device itself, which contains several uh, items. For example, obviously the main charge, you need a detonator, this we all know now, but you also need some way to explode the bomb at the moment that you want. You need a trigger mechanism. Uh, for this, one can use many things. Active, uh, for example, somebody uh, really pushes a button, rings a phone, or sends a signal that will detonate the, uh, the EID. You have a passive uh, uh, trigger mechanism. That's typically a, a timer, uh, something that will make the bomb explode after a certain amount of time. And you have a booby trap, basically a, a um, a type of trigger where if somebody for example, moves the bomb, it will explode. You obviously need to contain your explosive for that you need a containment, uh, a primary containment, like a pipe, for example, uh, or as you've seen before, simple plastic wrapping or duct tape, whatever. One needs an exterior because one usually doesn't go around walking with a finished bomb in hand and you put it in some kind of camouflage usually, uh, which can be anything from a book, as you can see here, this is a Unabomber's uh, bomb. Um, a book to conceal your bomb uh, can go to a uh, a car even uh, like Anders Breivik's um, uh, explosive device, which was a car basically, all the way to uh, things like uh, pressure pans uh, or whatever uh, basically. The last thing you can add is an enhancement, uh, and it's it's uh, it's known that for humans. The most damaging aspect of an explosion is actually not the shockwave per se, but the fragmentation. Now, the human body cannot stand um, the impact of small fragments at high velocity. So if you want to kill people, you will add maximum fragmentation, which usually takes the form of, for example, nails and stuff like that. This is, for example, the bomb made by the Boston Marathon bomber. Um, he used a pressure pan filled with fireworks, um, well, fireworks, the, the powder from fireworks, and nails and assorted uh, stuff. You now know, uh, you see here detonator, you now know um, the reason why he has to use a pressure cooker. Uh, you hopefully know if you've followed my presentation, because the fireworks are obviously low explosives, so you need to have a strong confinement to have an explosion. A pressure cooker is obviously made to contain pressure, so it's the perfect receptacle for such a low explosive. Uh, if you would have done the same thing with a plastic bottle, for example, the result would not have been nearly as destructive. The complexity of an EID um, is also very, I mean, it can vary a lot. Uh, it can be very simple, like this pressure pan, a simple, a simple detonator hooked up to a timer. It can be very complex. Here we see the device used in the Las Vegas bombings of the 1980s, um, a electrical engineer, damn you engineers, um, was trying to blackmail a casino by building a very intricate uh, explosive device using a panel full of switches. Uh, I think it's in the previous um, material. So a lot of the switches. And he, he also built um, anti-tamper devices into this entire uh, box, planted it in the middle of the casino, and basically said, you're going to pay me X million amounts of dollars and I will tell you the right order in which to pull these switches or otherwise your casino will explode. Um, this is in the States, so uh, Americans being Americans, they decided to try to uh, defuse this bomb, which failed and blew up a part of the, um, of the casino anyway. So just to illustrate, a EID can be as simple as this and as complex as this. There is really no limit except the imagination and the skill of the one who builds it. Um, also, the eyes can be deceiving. Um, for example, we see here a pipe bomb, which is one of the reasons why I always say uh, never move explosive devices. Even if you think you know, you probably don't. And this is, for example, a, a typical pipe bomb with a fuse. At first glance, you would say, oh, the trigger mechanism is a fuse. The fuse is not lit, so this, this thing is perfectly safe. I can move it around, put it out of harm's way. Alas, inside, the culprit may have put a, uh, a second uh, detonator or igniter in this case, using electricity and a uh, movement switch. Um, so if you would pick this up, you would set the switch off and it would explode in your hands, which is obviously 
usually what the person who built this wants to make it explode as close as possible to their human targets. So EIDs are a very tricky, uh, are a very tricky field, uh, very tricky to diffuse, very tricky to work with because your opponent is another human being, uh, which has all the uh, the intelligence and the uh, and the guile of a human. The explosives themselves are um, usually stolen. Uh, you can steal them. Um, you can buy them legally or illegally, depending on where you are. Uh, for example, fireworks are also kind of explosive. Uh, you see here below, for example, the explosion from the maritime bombings. I mean, pay attention to the big billowing white clouds, very typical for fireworks, which are kind of based on composition that they're resembling black powder. Uh, so you can already identify almost from the explosion itself which type of explosive you are you're dealing with. Uh. Um, we see, for example, here um, the uh, this is this is the uh, Marathon um, uh, bombing uh, bomb. You see here, for example, Timothy McVeigh, uh, uh, the uh, also famous uh, for a, a very big attack on a government building. He used stolen explosives from the mining uh, industry, Tovex, which is ammonium nitrate-based explosive, um, or they can be homemade. Uh, and we see this picture uh, down here. I think everybody will recognize that picture. It's of course. Uh, Zaventem, eh? there the uh, terrorists used acetone peroxide, uh, which I think is now also an explosive that has found its way to um, the, the layman, let's say. I think everybody has heard of it in, in the context of explosives. So by the way, up here is uh, Guy Fawkes, uh, maybe one of the first terrorists using explosives. He tried to blow up the House of Lords somewhere early 17th century uh, using a large amount of gunpowder, the gunpowder treason on plot. He, he failed. Uh, was caught before he could light the fuse. So literally caught with his uh, with his torch still light. Um, the acetone peroxide is the only, I'm not going to go into too much detail on EIDs. The nature of the information is rather sensitive. This is a public presentation after all. Um, but the acetone peroxide though, I would like to go, I mean, just quickly tell you about it because I guess everybody has questions about it. Um, it is in essence an incredibly useless explosive. I mean, from a military perspective, it is very sensitive. It's a primary explosive, but it's also chemically unstable. It will slowly decompose. It's, it's sublimes, meaning it will evaporate from the salt state. So if you have it, for example, in a, a, a pot or whatever, it will slowly start to crystallize on the edges, which is, an, which is very unpleasant. It's very sensitive to all sorts of contamination, like metals or acids, which will render it even more uh, sensitive. So this is on the whole a explosive that would never be considered by the military. But for um, the, the uh, let's say, bomb maker, it has one very useful feature that is, it is extremely easy to make from commonly obtained uh, materials being acetone, hydrogen peroxide, and an acid. So um, it's also relatively powerful. It's a bit less powerful than TNT, but still, I mean, definitely powerful enough uh, as history certainly proves to cause a quite significant damage. Since this process is simple, but um, does require some care, if improper conditions are used, you may generate the dimer instead of the trimer, which is even more sensitive. So also a lot of accidents have happened uh, with this TATP, whether it's being used for terrorism or as a hobby, so to speak. This is a very dangerous molecule. Eh? It's not a very, not a very I mean, useful explosive, actually, except, of course, if you anyway aren't very um, interested in your own uh, life. Here you see, for example, a um, manufacturing I plant is perhaps the wrong word, but the manufacturing site of TATP, you can see huge amounts, and you hopefully will know after this presentation that to have such large amounts of primary explosive is akin to suicide. Um, of course, there are a few tricks to make it a bit more stable, but in the end, it's still a very hazardous and unstable uh, material. And on this note, I will finish. And I will be more than happy to answer any of your burning questions. I hope that I have shown you the breadth of chemical explosives. I have to tell you, there are plenty more than what you've seen today. Um, I had to make a selection. I chose the most uh, important ones. Many didn't make the cut uh, to my uh, sadness, uh, like here, DDMP um, and nitrogen trichloride. I mean, there are, there are, there are so many different explosive molecules um, out there. It's, uh, it's, it's a very rich, uh, very rich chemistry. All right, and with this, I will, stop the presentation and start answering some questions. Okay, thank you very much 
for your nice historical uh, overview and also the different explosives that exist. So we will now indeed have um, a look at some questions because there were some questions in uh, the Q&A already. So everyone can still add their questions and we'll just go, uh, go over them one by one. Sure. Uh, so the first question is, um, is sulfur a true catalyst? So does it change the reaction path or does it just bind everything together? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I expect that, of course, because when your chemist sees a catalyst, a catalyst, I mean, it's not a catalyst in the strict chemical sense, right? A real catalyst is also usually not consumed, um, whereas um, sulfur definitely is. So it's called a catalyst, but it's more, it's a binder, but it's not just a binder. It's, it's because it melts and it it's 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 basically causes the the ignition temperature of the black powder to go down, making it easier to ignite. You can make black powder without sulfur; that's not a problem. But it will be more difficult to ignite. So in that sense, it's a catalyst. It's a catalyst in the sense it makes it easier to ignite, but it's not a catalyst in the strict chemical sense. It doesn't really change the pathway. No, 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 indeed. Okay. Um, the next question. Um, so if uh, it's dried out. Picric acid is found, the EOD is always called um, in to blow it up. However, when the picric acid crystals are in a glass bottle with a glass plug, no metal picrates can have been formed. So is it not safer wetting the crystals? And do you know any incident with crystallized picric acid in chemistry storage or in pharmacies that already happened? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question. I, I always gotten that uh, quite a few times uh, when I'm talking to the firemen, for example. And technically, yes, of course. Um, like I said before, picric acid is a very stable explosive. I mean, it's telling that it has been known for decades before people realized it was an explosive. Huh? So it's indeed it's quite uh, uh, it's quite insensitive as long as there's no metal contamination. There is only one thing one has to be careful of: if the crystals are very large, I'm talking about centimeters long, then breaking the crystal can, in theory, um, cause um, a detonation, although it's rather rare. But indeed, I think these picric acid bottles in schools, again, unless there was metal involved, sometimes they exaggerate a bit, but I guess people also really like to err on the side of caution, I suppose. But indeed, if you wet them, technically they are okay. The only thing you have to be very sure of, of course, is that you don't know what happened to those bottles. You need to make sure that whoever used it when it was still being used regularly didn't contaminate it somehow uh, by accident. That, of course, you may not know. Eh? So in that case also, it might be prudent to just choose the uh, the most uh, well, safest way to, to dispose of it. But to be quite honest, I am not very scared of uncontaminated picric acid. It's quite, uh, it's quite stable. Okay, uh, the next question. So uh, are there any explosives uh, consisting well, that are not consisting of NOx um, containing compounds. Well, we saw the small metal particles and uh, the TATP. But can you maybe comment on this or the most mm -hmm. with NOx compounds? Or is it just a selection you made here? Um, it is actually it's an, it's an interesting question. The nitro compounds are the most prevalent because they have, not because they're the only explosive, there are plenty without but they usually have the most interesting properties. And you also have to keep in mind, nitric acids and the nitrating mixtures are very cheap commodity chemicals. So it's very cheap to, to use nitration as a means for making explosives. But there are plenty others. Huh? For example, nitrogen trichloride is an example. Uh, there is no oxygen in there even, uh, only chlorine. Very sensitive explosive, though I have to say. Um, there are plenty others. Azides come to mind, uh, they have no oxygen. Um, you also have explosives like, in the end, fulminates, uh, like mercury fulminate. Okay, there is an oxygen in there, but it's a fulminate group, not a nitro group. Um, I can think of others, actually nitrogen fluoride, some of them, small molecular ones, are also explosive. Um, for sure, um, there are others than nitro groups, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, there are a lot of questions, so... Um... Satellites, satellites, another one, satellites. Uh, Copper satellites, silver satellite, all explosive, contain not even nitrogen, uh, only carbon. So you just need to have a molecule with a, with, a, with a high energy and a pathway to release the energy quickly. Then you have an yeah, explosive. Yeah, um, then the next question is more about yeah, safety. Um, are there any progress maybe in, in, in chemistry or in chemically uh, break down explosives to make bomb disposal easier and less dangerous? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the thing is, um, 
this bomb disposaling is usually not done by destroying the molecules chemically. The reason for that being is you would have to know exactly which explosive you're dealing with, which is hard, right? Because it, you need to interact then very closely with the device. Um, second, you need to put some kind of reagent on a homemade explosive, which is not very nice. What is done is, um, for example, spraying a phlegmatizing su uh, substance on it, meaning things like um, um, even sometimes diesel or thick oils with um, um, phlegmatizing agents that try to soak into the explosive and desensitize it. That is done. What's even done, although not very often, is some explosives can even be super cooled by, for example, liquid nitrogen, rendering them very difficult to, to initiate. And of course, simple water. Right? If you have a low explosive, like, like uh, um, black powder, for example, simply wetting it will render it completely insensitive. So really destroying the molecules chemically on site isn't done, but phlegmatizing it, absolutely yes. Okay, uh, the next one, I hope it's not from someone who tried, will try it herself or himself, but which charge is typically used in uh, grenades? In grenades, the charge is typically RDX. Uh, actually, depending on the type of grenade, it's usually composition B, so RDX with TNT because it's a little bit cheaper and it's easier to pour. Um, the detonator is lead azide with usually also RDX as this kind of booster charge or sometimes PETM, but usually RDX. So a grenade contains around, depending on the type, 200 grams of, of composition B uh, or, or something similar. Yeah, so, I, so the compositions can all can alter. Um, Depending on the manufacturer, yes. Yeah. But almost all of them are, are based on RDX. Again, RDX is the military explosive even to this day. So it's so cheap and so useful and so powerful. It's just a, a great molecule. Yeah. Okay, the next question. Um, how would you measure the explosive properties of a compound and then especially without destroying your analytical device? Actually... You always destroy the little device. <laughs> so it's a good question. There's a couple of things. Well, first of all, nowadays, we also use computational methods. Eh? So yeah. the, the computational methods have really advanced uh, up to the point that now you will see in literature sometimes people already predicting from a molecular structure, similar to medicinal chemistry, whether it's going to be an interesting explosive or not. And then they synthesize and check if the properties are really true. Um, but yes, measuring, for example, the, the velocity detonation is a destructive process. The old way was to zip, insert two sensors. You make a, a stick of explosive of a very consistent density. You put one, one sensor here, one sensor there, you detonate on one end, and you simply measure the electrical pulses between when the explosive hit, hits the first sensor and the second sensor. Nowadays, people also use high-speed cameras because they have gotten very good. So you can literally see the detonation wave and you can use that to calculate the, the um, detonation. Um, all the other yeah. tests, for example, the gas generation uh, speed and so on, maximum pressures are all destructive tests. Yeah, <laughs> they, they destroy the material, absolutely. The, 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 um, the analytical material, absolutely, yeah. So the computational way still is the safest way. I it guess. is the safest way, but not the most accurate yeah. one. In the end, yes. you got to blow stuff up. So it is fun. So, you know, they don't mind. Don't worry. Uh, then a question about uh, the synthesis of the TATP. So is synthesis typically done with cooling? Um, so the, the aceton, uh, well, it's more general question, I think. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So is the synthesis typical done with cooling? So for example, with aceton mm -hmm. and the peroxide? Um, because I think it might be uh, kind of disadvantage to have heat during the synthesis. Yes, this is true for almost all, no, not all, but almost all um, nit uh, nitrations and also in, in this case the ATP formation because, well, first of all, most um, of these reactions are, they, they, they give off a lot of energy. In the end, you're using very reactive chemicals because you want to impart the molecule with, with a high energy to make it an explosive, right? So the reaction itself also releases a lot of heat. And obviously, you need to cool it down. One reason is, of course, you don't want to blow yourself up. But second of all, also, you may not get an explosion, but just a runaway reaction, because many of these compounds are also thermally unstable. So maybe they're loot enough not to explode, but they can just start giving a lot of heat, uh, or, uh, giving a lot of gas, and they can also, you know, just explode from your mm -hmm. from your reactor, which is which is unfortunate. Or they can make other compounds that are, for example, TTP is a good example. If there you don't cool, you'll get something, but it's the dimer, which is much more sensitive and very dangerous, even more dangerous to handle. So you want to cool for sure. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, uh, okay, thank you. Um, then I had also a question uh, about the legal aspect. So for the military explosives then, for example, I, well, especially for the military explosives, are there some legal restrictions or is it just the more damage the better or how, how do you need no. to see that? There are no legal restrictions on, on the type of explosives, no. Um, absolutely not, in fact. Uh, the only limitation is what they want to what they want to fire there are no there is no restrictions on it like for example for chemical weapons no no i guess because uh, modern warfare re relies so much on explosives that it's hard to uh, and also you know an explosives in the end their effect hasn't changed from their initial use it's just they got more powerful or more a, a, a good point, though, maybe I would say is one thing the military is very interested in, especially the American military, is um, selective munition. Munition that they can change almost on the fly how powerful it will be. For example, because yeah, you know that a lot of um, war theaters now, especially uh, American war theaters, are in built-up areas where there are also civilians. And then if you want to destroy a very particular target, yeah, and you don't want to destroy half the city block, you need to have an explosive that's very tailored to its use, but maybe when you're there, your your intel changes at the last minute, it's difficult to change your weapon. Whereas if you would have a, a missile, for example, where you can basically say, I want this yield of explosion power right now, enter and you shoot the missile, that is interesting for them, but there is no legal restrictions, no. Okay, and then um, I will combine two questions. So there's a question about the, the research on explosives. So are, are there uh, other institutes who are qualified to research um, explosives beside the military yes and um, if yes in uh, in which research field are they mainly working in fact there are many uh, universities working um, on it's definitely not only the military in fact usually the military there are exceptions uh, in the states there are and I, and I assume in other large nations they have similar institutes there are institutes like the um, Los Alamos or China Lake where they really have labs government labs where they do research but many of the research is also done in universities with funding from the military for example also for example in europe there is a famous lab in germany uh, by a professor called Kalputke, and he makes new explosives so just comes up with new explosives you do see the um the academic labs usually focus on um, the molecular aspects, making new explosives and so on. The new compositions, the new like PBXs and so on, that's usually done by the military because obviously requires specialized testing grounds, right? You want to test a weapon, you need to be able to make a weapon. That's not something a university usually does. But making the molecules, for example, absolutely. There are some very active research groups all over the world, university research groups who are just making new explosive molecules, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then, um, again, a more practical question. What would be a typical explosive for blowing up ATM? Um, and what are the developments in, well, on this market? And uh, an ATM? ATM, you mean a, a cash machine? Yeah, yeah. Well, ah, yeah. I, I, I guess they mean it like that indeed. Yeah, yeah so the, um, the plofkraken, as I say in Dutch, uh, it's yeah. also indeed a very active field. Um, the methods have changed. Uh, they change all the time. Um, there's many different methods. In fact, there's only one method that uses high explosives, which is the so-called pizza uh, method, where they slide a very thin slab of explosive material um, into the, 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 the device and then explode it. But actually, they usually use acetylene gas, actually. Uh, they usually just fill up the, uh, the machine with uh, explodable gas and then explode it with a flame um, because the gas is actually the useful part there is it goes into the machine, goes in all the yeah. openings, hollows, and then they detonate it. So actually, uh, explode it if not detonation. So actually, they usually use gas, actually. Um, it, high explosives are used, it's rather rare, also because it's much harder to obtain, right? Settling gas, you can just buy it in a DIY store. So uh, why would they go for more complex uh, Yeah, things? indeed, yeah, that's quite logic. Mm -hmm. um, and then is the reaction mechanism different between deflagration and detonation, um, or are they the same, namely based on forming intermediate radicals? Um, actually, that's also a good question. Um, well. There are explosives, for example, that can deflagrate. For example, nitrocellulose is a good example. Nitrocellulose is a typical deflagrating explosive with a mild ignition. But if you compress nitrocellulose to high density and you ignite, you, you detonate it with a strong detonator, it actually detonates. And that's a completely, that's a different mechanism, right? That's an auto decomposition. 
and usually the mechanisms are different. It is, however, difficult to say much about it because obviously studying the chemistry of detonation is pretty hard, right? First of all, it's extremely rapid, and second of all, yeah, your 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 analytical device will will, will blow up. And measuring things like rest detonation is still okay, but to do like analytical work on intermediates, that's usually only done theoretically because it's very hard to to look into the reaction at the moment it's going on because it's yeah it's exploding. So. Uh, but definitely, yes, there, there can be different mechanisms for both, absolutely. Okay, then there's also a question. Um, explosives in combination with uh, firework are metals added. So I think the question is, is it just then um, explosives with metals? Mm -hmm. um, wait, sorry, uh, repeat that. The explosive with metals? or Explosives in combination with firework are metal, metals added. So I think um... he asks what, what is firework actually. So I, I, I am. Think yeah, yeah. So fireworks now. Fireworks is actually a very, um, it's a complex field. Uh, it's actually, in a sense, easier to make a bomb to blow up a house than to make a, a nice piece of firework. Because firework is also an art. There's also a little bit less science to it. I mean, it's modernized, of course, recently as well. But um, because fireworks requires, it, it has some of the usual suspects, like, for example, black powder for, for propelling a, a piece of fireworks into the air, for example. But then it uses, it's, it's never a pure compound almost. They use, for example, um, uh, pieces of aluminium to get these kind of star effects or magnesium. They add salts, which may not in themselves be combustible. For example, what you can do is instead of using potassium nitrate, use strontium nitrate, which will give a red color. Mm -hmm. So it, it involves using different elements, different combinations. Making a piece of firework is truly an art. It's not so easy. For example, that, you know, those, those arrows that make this kind of high-pitched whistling sound? To make that, actually, you have to kind of make a, a suspension, a solid suspension of picrate salts, very sensitive, into your normal propellant mixture. And when these little grains are hit by the, by the propagating flame, they will make mini explosions. And those mini explosions will, will cause a resonation that causes high-pitched whistling effect. So you can see this is a very complex matter. And that's also, I think, why fireworks have always been a kind of artisanal uh, thing. Um, and everybody, everybody has their own recipes in their own ways. It's not so easy. It's usually a, a, yeah, a complex interchange of different compounds. It's not just one compound usually. Yeah, so it's indeed more complex than you would initially think. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, then I have another in interesting question actually about the grenades again. Mm -hmm. So um, how does the pin system work actually? Yeah. That is also a good question. So um, the trigger mechanism there is obviously not a fuse. <laughs> also keep in mind, in the military, especially things like grenades, they're going to be thrown around. You need to have maximum reliance. And then usually mechanical means are best. So actually what happens when you pull the pin from a grenade is, uh, I mean, as long as you hold the, the lever, it nothing happens. As soon as you release the lever, actually a metal pin strikes a, a igniter pan, similar to a bullet actually, that causes a kind of spark. And then a slow burning mixture is in there. So in the center of the grenade, there is a tube with a slow burning mixture at the top. This mixture is slowly, five seconds, uh, smolders, but it's not so trivial because the mixture is kind of special because it cannot generate gas because then your grenade will already start swelling up. So it's a mixture that just propagates uh, heat, fire, smoldering, and not doesn't make gas uh, while, it's, while it's combusting. It goes all the way down until it hits actually the real detonator. So actually there is a chemical delay in there, a, a chemical delay that burns for a very fixed amount of time uh, until, it, until it hits the actual detonator. So also that's why once the, 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 you remove the pin, you remove the, the lever, the, the, the inside the firing pin strikes, the grenade is live. You cannot pull to put the pin back or anything. It's too late because it's already burning on the inside. So then it will explode. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, then um, we already covered quite a lot, a lot of questions. I think I'll go for the last one. Mm -hmm. um, if there's a, pack, a package of TA, TATP, which slowly decomposes, would it be possible to measure the acetone, for example, with the PID? PID? Mm -hmm. Yes, but the problem is the decomposition is 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 very depending on the quality of the material. If it's if it's um, very well high quality, it take it's very slow. So perhaps you could if you got really really close. But if you can get so close, it's better to do, for example, a Raman or, or something like that to to measure the uh, which is also used, of course, to measure the material. So there, it doesn't really make um, much sense to then sample the 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 air. Also. Uh, 
yeah, acetone is a commodity chemical. It would give maybe some false positives as well, depending on where you are. But the interesting part, of course, of TTP is though, it, because it sublimes and decomposes, um, traces of it are very hard to find after an explosion. You know, if you want to do forensics after an explosion, most explosives, when they explode, you will always find minuscule particles of explosion that didn't explode, that didn't explode somewhere on the side. You can use it to analyze which explosive was used. Not so with TTP because it decomposes by itself and sublimes. So whatever traces left after an explosion will slowly disappear. That's why it was called the invisible explosive uh, for a while. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think we are through all the questions. Um, I want to thank you very much for your nice presentation and also for taking the time to answer so many questions because My you pleasure. have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, and I think, well, I'm quite sure everything was quite clear from your presentation, also from the uh, questions you answered. Normally, we would give you a small present now, which is virtually quite impossible. So <laughs> we, will, uh, we will handle that uh, later. So first of all, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, the audience very much for the questions and for listening of course this evening um, and then yeah I have one thing to say so uh, good evening everyone and see you next month again bye 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 have fun and stay safe